when we're kind of thinking about all of these nutrients that we're taking in very intentionally and specifically, let's bring inflammation, chronic inflammation into the picture. Is that, is chronic inflammation something that you're very aware of as kind of perpetuating neurodegeneration? Well, so I, I want your listeners to know that inflammation is a normal physiologic process that we need to maintain and repair our tissues, to uh, uh, destroy pathogens, destroy internal threats, to repair the wear and tear that occurs uh, through everyday life. So inflammation is, is part of normal physiology. Excess and dysregulated inflammation becomes path, uh, pathologic. Because of the toxicities in our environment, we can change the receptors on our cells so our cells look foreign and damaged. That becomes a problem. We can have excessive inflammation because we have increased permeability in, in the gut lining, allowing food proteins to get into the bloodstream where our body you know, sees that as foreign and begins creating uh, uh, antibodies attacking those food proteins. And if those food proteins are similar to other structures in my body, then you know that's a problem. Milk proteins are similar to structures in my brain. And of course, if I'm creating antibodies against those milk proteins, I'm also creating antibodies against structures in my cerebellum, uh, affecting uh, my movements, my coordination. Uh, so dysregulated inflammation is a huge problem. Uh, this is tied deeply to toxic um, toxins in our environment and to increase leakiness of the intestinal lining, allowing these food proteins to get into our bloodstream. Well, now you've opened the gut health door, so I must yeah. walk through it. And I know you've Absolutely. looked at how these dietary interventions can impact the microbiome. Will you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, uh, we, we presented uh, some really interesting data uh, from my WAVES trial comparing the low saturated uh, fat swank diet uh, to the modified paleo walls diet, uh, and then the observation period when people were eating their usual diet. We collected poop uh, at, as, at, during the observation period and poop during the intervention period. And then we asked the question, are there microbial communities that predict you're going to have a very nice response when you start on the swank diet or you start on the walls diet? And uh, it's super interesting. We could see that, yes, there are microbial communities that will tell us that you're going to respond really well to swank. A different set of communities will respond really well to walls. And there are, again, different communities that tell us you will not respond well to swank and you will not respond well to walls. What, what this tells me is that the, you know, the food that we eat is going to be acted on by our microbes and that will then uh, create new metabolites that get into our bloodstream that will, again, talk to my brain and to my immune cells. If I have the right microbial community, then I'm going to have a great response to swank or maybe a great response to walls. I predict that there will be a time when I can come in uh, to my physician's office, I'll um, give them some saliva, they'll take some blood, I'll give them some urine, they'll give me uh, a little wipe, I'll go to the bathroom, and I'll wipe my uh, backside, so we'll have a little uh, uh, rectal swab as well, and they'll analyze that over the next four weeks. Then we'll get a report that will say, okay, Dr. Walls, given your microbiome and your uh, genetics, what we know is that you could do really well on a ketogenic diet, you do fairly well, on a paleo, uh, you'll do terribly on a low-fat diet. Uh, but Kalia, you, on the other hand, would do great on a low-fat vegetarian diet, and you would do terrible on a carnivore or ketogenic diet. So there will be a time when we can give people that very specific information. Here are the diets that you'll do really well with. Here are the diets you do okay with, and here are things that you'll not do at all well. And then you and your family could say, well, I, we can't do that. Culturally, it's just not going to work for us. But we could do these, these diets that maybe, while they aren't the, the best, 
they still would be pretty good. And those are things that we actually could implement. This, this will be, um, I, I think, really a game changer for people. That sounds like a dream come true in terms of precision medicine. But right now, when we don't have access to those tools, how do we select the right diet for someone in terms of Mediterranean versus paleo versus ketogenic? So in, in, my, in my approach, I look at their metabolic health. I look at their, um, so I look at insulin and insulin sensitivity. Um, uh, I look at their current uh, lipids. Uh, I look at their family history and ideally get an APA4. Uh, that will be very helpful if they're open to doing that. Uh, and then I talk with their family. You want a big intervention. Do you need the easiest intervention for you to implement? Do you need uh, a, a intervention that takes it into account your spiritual beliefs? You may have a deep commitment to being a vegetarian. You may have a strong cultural preference uh, to a Mediterranean diet. You may have a strong preference for a carnivore diet. So, so I want to know both about the family and the family's cultural preferences, the uh, risk factors, what are the health conditions that uh, the person wants to address, wants to prevent. And then we will, I'll tell them what I think is the most therapeutic diet. And then We'll have a conversation. Can you implement that? Is that too hard? Do we need something that is more realistic for you? And what are you most curious about? Something, a question that plagues me that I'm so excited I get to ask you is sometimes it seems like there are patients who are good candidates for a ketogenic diet, but they don't need to lose weight. Can we put them on a keto diet and maintain their body weight? Um, so we've been very successful at that. In my clinical trials, um, we have to keep, you know, I have a plan. We won't put people on a ketogenic diet uh, in our study if their BMI is below 20. In my practice, I won't put my ketogenic diet if their BMI is below 19. Uh, and then we increase, so I put them on a ketogenic diet. Uh, if they're losing weight, we liberalize the carbs, and then I may use ketone salts and uh, supplement that way. So it can be done. But, but there are some absolute contraindications. I'm going to run that. Run Please that do. For everyone. <laughs> if you're pregnant, you cannot do a ketogenic diet. If you're breastfeeding, you cannot do a ketogenic diet. And by the way, you can't do a low-carb paleo diet, pregnant or breastfeeding. If you're pregnant, you got to have the OB doc sign off on whatever diet plan they're going to do. And I caution people that even the lower carb uh, paleo diets, breastfeeding, because that, that is a big demand on mom, can tip people into uh, ketoacidosis. So mom starts having nausea, vomiting. She needs carbs and has to go to the emergency room and get checked and taken care of. And usually um, a um, carbohydrate drink. Uh, and salvia fluids will take care of all of that. But if you know if she's developing a bladder infection, that can also accelerate that as well. Uh, and then uh, you know severe weight loss. I've had people uh, understand that ketogenic diets are really good for cognitive decline, and they can develop um, a ketogenic diet and then develop orthorexia and become uh, more and more fixated on their food uh, and. Uh, get into a spiral of uh, weight loss uh, that's uh, quite damaging. And in, in people who are on a ketogenic diet for their autoimmune condition have often taken uh, very potent disease modifying treatments that do increase the risk of developing a lymphoma, uh, leukemia, and other cancers. 